this is one of the things that if I could get this message across to every single person who interacts with a young human under the age of three, if I could get this one message across, it's this is a human being with all the complexity and all the parts that you have. They are not a cute little doll. Welcome to the More Than Corporate Podcast. I'm Amber Furman, recovering perfectionist and serial accomplisher. If you're anything like I used to be, you've been living your life thinking that if you accomplish enough stuff, you'll finally find the success you've always wanted. But what if it's not about accomplishing more stuff? What if it's about accomplishing the right stuff? I believe you don't find success. You create it by intentionally designing the life you want and having the courage to get out of your comfort zone to live your design. I went from doing what I was supposed to do to doing what I love to do, and now I get to help others do the same. Keep listening as I chat with inspiring people who make it their mission to live their best life every day and learn how you too can live the life you've always wanted. Welcome back to another episode of the More Than Corporate Podcast. I'm going to say it again. I'm really excited for the guest that I have. Um, I hesitate for those of you who um, have not listened to this show because I feel like I say that about every single guest and then I find people that I'm like super stoked for and I'm still really excited for them. Um, Dr. Carol Scott is an amazing guest that I'm really excited to dig into. She's a trauma-informed developmental psychologist. She's a TEDx speaker, a coach, an author. She brings the self-awareness success strategies or SAS to help you get better get along better on the adult playgrounds you play on, which I absolutely love that so much. I get so tired of people telling me that I have to grow up. And I love talking to somebody who's telling me that it is okay to live on a playground and how do we navigate that. So I'm really excited to dig into that with her. She also believes and knows that your success today is determined by your first seven years of life. She knows that it's never too late for developmental do-overs. And as her coaching clients, they'll bring your unique goals for success. She puts out that SaaS system that you need to be able to achieve them. And together you repattern how you operate in every relationship at the heart of your success. I have so many things to talk to Dr. Scott about that I believe we could go for seven hours. So we're going to do our best to keep this in the 60 minutes that you're going to spend with us today. So with that being said, before I bring in Dr. Scott, I do want to remind you that this episode is brought to you by Success Development Solutions and the Design Your Life Mastermind. If you are somebody who feels like you have worked so hard to get to the level of success that you envisioned in your mind, and now you have all of the things that were supposed to create that level of success, like this cake you're trying to bake, and if your baking skills are anything like mine, it is not edible. You're not fulfilled. It is not something that you really expected at this time. If you feel like you've done everything right and you are not achieving the type of success that you envisioned, then let's have a conversation about where things went wrong in that plan for you, what you misjudged or what you put too much weight on and how we can redefine what your life looks like so that you can have the success you've always wanted. If that sounds like something that you would like, please head over to successdevelopmentsolutions.com slash contact. Let's get on a quick free discovery call and find out what success means to you and how you can achieve it. With that being said, let's go ahead and jump into this conversation with Dr. Scott. Good, hey, morning. good morning. How are you? Hey, Amber. I'm good. I'm ready to get sassy with you and feel free to call me Carol. Carol, thank you so much. I am so excited for this because I also believe now and understand now in a way I didn't before how important the years that a lot of us don't have any memories of actually dictate everything that we do. And so I love that you lead with that. I love that you talk about playgrounds. I love so much. So let's start with what it was like when you were in that developmental stages. I like to go back to high school or college age, whichever fits mm. for you, where we thought we had it all figured out. We didn't need anybody else's advice and we knew exactly what our life was going to look like. Exactly. What did you think your life was going to be? Um, unfortunately, my high school years were the beginning of some very maladaptive young adult coping strategies for my earlier childhood that was full of trauma. So mm -hmm. I was looking at how do I keep this pain at bay? Drinking worked pretty well. 
I found alcohol was a good solution. And, uh, and then pretty soon street drugs, lots of pot available in the early 70s, you know. So um, what I did was I was medicating pain. And I thought if I could medicate my pain, that was success. I think that was all the higher I was looking. And I fully expected to not be around anymore after about age 30. I didn't think I'd last very long in this wow. life. And, and so when I talk about development do-overs and remaking and repatterning your life, I am speaking very deeply from personal experience as well as from my PhD in child development. Do you think that in some way, your experiences as you pulled yourself out of that place that you were in was a driving force for your choice to go into developmental psychology? You know, they came so close uh, together and interweaved, interwove with each other uh, in so many ways. I can't help but feel like they're two parts of a pretty spiritually led, spirit driven path for me. Um, when I first took a child development class, just as an undergraduate elective in my degree in psychology, I was pretty sure I was headed for being a clinical psychologist. So I took child development just because you know, my advisor said it was an easy A, frankly. And child development grabbed a hold of me in a way that I can't even describe. And I really literally felt dragged into a new life. Mm -hmm. And so I changed my major. After that one class, I changed it to child development and pursued a whole career with multiple degrees in child development after that. Um, and once I got started, I think that then led me to an understanding that things could be different for me. And I went to therapy and my therapist was very good at using the kids in front of me. I was running um, university laboratory preschools at that point in my career. So I was in charge of a preschool with a bunch of kids, three to five years of age, their families, and a whole bunch of college students who were learning from me about child development. So that was kind wow. of my, my gig back then. And uh, so I had a laboratory literally in front of me demonstrating children's early social and emotional development to me who had completely lost all of that, hadn't really navigated those that period very well at all. And so she would use examples of, well, what about, how do the three-year-olds in your classroom do that? How do the five-year-olds do that? And so this model of the self-aware success strategies comes directly from that intersection of recovery from trauma and knowing about child development. Because what I know is there are seven success strategies for social and emotional intelligence and getting along on adult playgrounds that most of us came out of those first seven years without. And yeah, it's time. I think, <laughs> it's time to get you know, them. There's a couple of things that are screaming at me as you're talking. The first is something that I've talked about in a couple of different episodes, and I'm looking forward to getting your feedback and knowledge on. Um, you talk about your experiences with trauma and your coping strategies, and I can relate to that so much. My coping strategies were academics. I can find people who I have very similar backgrounds with that took a path of crime, alcohol, drugs, whatever that looked like for them. And then I had a brief stint with alcohol coping and then went to academic coping. And then when we get to our end places, everybody thinks I'm the success story. And everybody thinks that they're the screw up. And if you trace back our stuff, it was, I just coped differently. And my coping mechanism right. was more societally acceptable than right. theirs. How do we start to help people understand that just because you look successful doesn't mean you're okay? Oh, that is such a splendid question. Yeah. <laughs> and I got to say, my, uh, as you might be able to guess, my coping strategies also included academic success. Yeah. I am really good at school. I'm really good at testing. I write well. I speak well. I'm a smart, big-headed person. And so that gave me a whole other array of coping strategies. And I went for food, too, not just drugs and alcohol. Ooh. Oh, no. I ate and ate and ate until I weighed over 300 pounds at one point. And for a big wow. chunk of my younger life, I did. So I like said, oh, let me show the world in all the ways I can think of that I'm really screwed up. But then I hit a lot of that too. You know, so it's yeah. like part of what got me clean and sober was the awareness that there was kind of a pretty major disconnect between my professional emerging professional life as a young doctoral student at that point and what I did with my private time. Those those two things were pretty shockingly mm. divergent. And that helped me to see that something needed to change. But I think what we need to, to notice is what are 
what are the what are the signs that we're seeing? I mean, we know what it looks like. People are um, eating unhealthily. They're living unhealthy lives. They're smoking cigarettes. They're um, maybe in unhealthy relationships. That's a good one. They have a ton of anxiety. Um, I used to have a staff member who every time I came into a room and she was unaware of me, would literally almost jump out of her skin. She was so wow. easy to startle, had so much anxiety in her body. So what are the signs that tell you that something's not okay? Oh, oh, pay attention to them. They mean something. They are evidence of ways in which we are creating barriers to hold ourselves back from success. So this goes directly into my second point that came up while you were talking. And that is that I don't know how many adults actually know or remember what it feels like to not be in survival mode. And so when we start to say, pay attention to those things, mm -hmm. how do we start to tell people what those things really look like and feel like? Because to them, it's normal from the time that they were a child. Right. So part of what I do with my coaching work for the self-aware success strategies is to start with sort of behavioral assessment, things that are easy to observe. Don't tell me about your childhood. Tell me what you do now today mm. when this happens. So how are you behaving today with other people? So do you have places in your relationships where you find yourself feeling resentful often? Somebody does something and you resent it. You have that sense of how dare you. Mm. You know, how, tell me about when you feel how dare you in relationships, because how dare you, your resentment is a clue that somebody just failed to recognize you for who you think you are. Somebody just missed out on seeing your identity in a way that you thought they should be able to. And you were disappointed. And instead of feeling disappointed, you're resenting them for doing it, mm -hmm. even though maybe what you thought they should see in you was something that you actively hide. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> yeah, that's powerful. And so much of what we know is broken relationships. And I, I talk about this a lot with my relationship with my mom, which has been repaired for a long time. It was really rocky. And it was rocky for exactly what you just said. Um, I didn't know what I know now. So I didn't know how to articulate that I was looking for her to see the things in me that I didn't want to acknowledge. And there was never going to be like, she was never going to be able to love me enough. She was never going to be able to acknowledge me enough. She was never going to be able to care for me enough to fill the hole of what I didn't feel for myself. But because I expected her to, because when parents become parents, they stop being human, right? Yes. So when I expected her to, because she's now this robot that carries the title of mom. So why can't she fix me? And why, and I don't even know if I'm, I don't even know I'm broken at the time, which I hate that word and also haven't been able to find a better way to describe it. So, um, I think what you just said is kind of that simple yet not easy way to solve everybody's relationship problems. Yeah. We have to look at what do we do without judgment? Okay, so I get resentful at so and so. Well, that would be really easy to beat myself up about, especially when I get it, that the reason I'm resenting them is because they didn't do something uh, to acknowledge who I am in a realm in which I pretty actively hide who I am. So, you know, it's kind of once I get that dynamic, it's easy to go into a shame spiral about it and just beat myself up. But that's not the point of doing it. The point of doing it is to learn from what's the pattern. It's an indicator. It's like a map pinpoint that tells you a pattern that that you can undo. And and so we can look at that in all kinds of ways in our lives without judgment. Here's another one. What do you need? What do you need in your life in relationship? Mm -hmm. Not, you know, new car, new house, that kind of need. What do you need in relationship? What do you need emotionally? What do you need interpersonally? What do you need psychologically? Um, and let's make a list of the things yeah, you need. That. And if you're, if you're having a hard time thinking of things that you need because needing things has been uh, framed for you as something unattractive, being yes. needy, right? So if you have a hard time identifying things you need, here's a helpful tool. Here's 12 categories of the kinds of things humans all need. Normalize need. So first of all, look at your behavior, normalize your behavior as a normal human mm. response to stress, trauma, um, 
and dis-ease of the psychological kind, not the physical dis-ease, but the, the kind of dis-ease that we have where we just don't feel comfortable in our skins as people. Yes. I love that you just said normalize need. Yeah. Because we all need something always. Many and things. that's normal. Yes. And, you know, you mentioned when we were talking about coping strategies, those unhealthy relationships. And I always used to ask in the, the least offensive way I could, which was still pretty offensive, why do they stay? I don't understand. Yeah. Right. Um, because I used to say, I'm a strong person. I would never let myself get in that situation. Mm -hmm. And then I heal and I look back at my relationships and just cause they didn't hit me doesn't mean they didn't, you know, manipulate or abuse in some way. Right. And it doesn't mean I didn't do the same in my relationships with them. Right. All right. because we're not supposed to need anything. Right. And what I want to talk about is that place of vulnerability that we all need to go when we start to realize these things. Cause unfortunately this is a place that I have just come out of. So I know it well, Yeah. Um, where we have finally realized that we have been the problem yeah. and we get to fix it. And now because we we're to. fixing it, yes, we get to, I love that. Um, because we're fixing it. When we see those behavioral traits in others, we run instead of stepping into that, which is just another way of avoiding relationships. How do we get ourselves to a point where we can protect ourselves? And I realize this is a deep question, so whatever you want to throw at it is fine. How do we get ourselves to a place where we can protect ourselves and also step into a place where others may not be exhibiting the behavior that we want to see? So I think this might be a good time to actually introduce the SAS and talk about them Perfect. specifically. And I call them the self-aware success strategies. It's S-A-S-S -S for a very good reason, because it always begins with self-awareness. Um, self-awareness is not something that is cultivated in children when they're young. And so you, in most children, I should say. And so as adults, we have to uh, kind of reclaim it as a mm. tool for growth, for personal growth. Being aware of what we're doing and why we're doing it is where it, it begins. So knowing that when you're born, you're basically a blob, <laughs> okay? If, if you haven't ever met a baby <laughs> who's a few days old to a few weeks old, um, it, it, let me tell you, it's incapable of pretty much everything that we think of as human. So uh, we are the most dependent species on the planet when we're born. We can't, you know, possum babies can crawl from birth canal to the mm. place where they nurse and get into that little pouch. <laughs> Kangaroo babies can do it. We mm. can't get to our food source as newborn infants. We are utterly incapable of taking care of ourselves. So what is the one strategy that we have at our disposal? We simply need people. And we have to trust them to mm -hmm. meet our needs. So trust begins the moment you're born to be something that you're learning about for about the first six months of your life. So can you trust that the world is there for you and will meet your needs when you have them? Or do you learn the lesson that the world is not really there for you and nobody has your back? And when you cry in the dark because you're hungry, sometimes mm -hmm. nobody comes. So you have one of those experiences predominantly in your life. Either you're the baby who has a lot of needs that nobody takes care of, or you're the baby who has a lot of needs that people take care of. And you come out of that experience differently. So for each of these seven success strategies, you have this developmental experience where you bring the strategy because it's what works for your age. And then the world responds to it and either accepts the strategy and helps you to be successful with it, or they teach you not to use your success strategy and they teach you to use a whole bunch of maladaptive alternatives. Mm. So the next example is independence. The success strategy of trust is followed by independence in the toddler. That's the desire to express who you are, what you want, what you think, and what you feel. Your opinions in the world become very important. Mm. The things you long for, like that shiny piece of foil on the carpet, and the things that uh, you emotions that are bubbling up inside your physiology because feelings are feel things they yeah. start in the body, right? So all of that is happening and you're trying to get it out of your mouth, but you don't yet speak the language and people think you're cute mostly. 
<laughs> Not so much me, when you're 30, right? Right, right. So <laughs> you're trying to tell people who you are. And you're not good at it yet. It's like you're not good at most of the things that you start when you're little. And so how that goes either honors and rewards your independence of thought, feeling, and desire. You either come into the world as someone who says, they see me, they know what I want, and they know what I feel, and they know what I think, and I'm good. They like me like this. Mm. Or you learn to codependently try to figure out what somebody else wants you to think, wants you to feel wants you to want and you come into the rest of your adulthood trying to fill a role that meets other people's expectations rather than have your own experience so trust independence then faith three-year-old child if you ever met a three-year-old you know why i called it faith because they believe in everything they have mm -hmm. the world is their oyster all things are possible magic fairies becoming another gender anything they can dream up they think they can do they believe in magic. They believe that the moon follows them home in the car. They see the world as a place without logic because for them it isn't. There isn't any logic in their minds. So they, they dream big dreams and they have faith in everything. And that's a very valuable success strategy as an adult to be creative, to have imagination, to play in the yeah. adult playground with the sense of play comes from being three years old and having that be your strategy in the world. Trace, so we have trust, independence, and faith. And I went slowly with those three because they're the heart of who you are. Yeah. And they're the heart of who we are as an adult too. And then we add to those. So those are like, that's who you, how you become the you that is you, that is uniquely you. And then you learn how to take that you out into the world and get along with other people. At four, your strategy is negotiation, getting what you want. <laughs> and they and are good at it. They are. At five, your strategy is vision, creating an idea that engages other people and gets them working with you. By six, they have the success strategy of compromise, letting go of part of what they want to get something that's more important. And by seven, they have the strategy of acceptance, mm. letting go of needing to control everything and knowing that sometimes stuff just doesn't work out no matter how hard you try. Mm. Bad things happen to good people. And you know what? Good things happen to bad people, which even sucks worse. Yeah. So there they are. Trust, independence, faith, negotiation, vision, compromise, and acceptance. And if we have those success strategies as adults, nothing is in the way of our success. Nothing. Yeah. There's a few things that are really interesting that are popping out for me. And the first is that the way that we perceive the things that you have talked about um, I'll go back to the very beginning where you were talking about crying and needing somebody and somebody not coming. Maybe they did come, but they just didn't come in time. And we coded that in a particular way, or maybe they said something to us that we heard in a particular way. And I think it's really important to highlight and get your opinion on the fact that not all the things that we hear that we take as negative were meant that way, that we perceived something that was completely good hearted in a way that was never intended by that person. But that intention doesn't matter once it lands in our brain. Um, and, and I say this because when I entered the speaking world, I heard and said the thing that breaks my heart the most, which is, well, my story is not that bad. So why mm -hmm. would anybody care? Or, but I had a good childhood, so what do I have to talk about? Mm -hmm. and, and what I learned was that for the mass majority of the population, if we're talking about long-term change instead of momentarily momentary motivation, right. those stories of people who had a good childhood and still are able to figure out where things got miscoded in their brain that they want to change – have much more power than the person who learned to walk again, because we can't relate to that. So where do we start to separate this idea of taking responsibility for our own personal growth and dealing with the things that we perceived being said or done to us as a child? Yeah, you know, you're so right. There's so much that gets in the way of good intention, of intended outcome, 
Um, I often will say, you know, when we when we look at that first six months, that infant who gets responded to or doesn't get responded to, an infant that doesn't get responded to isn't necessarily an infant that's in the middle of emotional neglect household or something. Yeah. It's not that their parents are automatically druggies or, you know, mom could have a really bad case of postpartum depression. And that could be all that's the problem. And maybe mom does come and she picks the baby up and she puts the bottle or the breast in the baby's mouth and then just stares off into space and never looks at the baby once. Things like that get coded by an infant's brain very differently than you and I would code them watching it as an adult, right? And that is, and I think coded is a very good word to use for this because from birth to three, our brain is literally being wired. It's being built. Yeah. When we're born, we have a big skull full of noodles <laughs> that aren't connected to each other, right? It's a plate of pasta. Nobody's put them together. And so all the inputs to our life after that literally pull those neurons together into the network that becomes the brain. And so when an experience like that happens, baby is feeding and looking at God, you know, to them. It's like yes. this, this thing, this being who is in charge of all. Um, They're looking with great hunger for connection. We are wired to connect. And the person they most long to connect with is not even looking at them. And it has no emotional expression on their face and is staring out the window. And so the brain is getting wired around that experience in a way that is different from the brain of the infant whose mother is looking at their face, making eye contact, talking, singing, making faces, et cetera. And so literally the coding is wired into our neural network for how we perceive forever afterwards, I would say, for how that baby grown up perceives people staring off into space. Yes. When they're listening to them, right? I love that you use this example and it's tying so much together for me because I was at a conference just recently and one of the guys that was speaking with me did this incredible thing I've never seen done before. And I loved it. We had 20 minutes to speak. And so instead of doing a 20 minute presentation, he asked if he could break his presentation down into 10, two minute things, and then weaved in and out of the presentation and gave leadership tips in two minute segments in between different speakers, which I thought was genius. Um, Because people listen, people can listen for two minutes. Yes. But one of the studies he talked about was with doctors. And they did a, um, they did a survey of patients. And they said, Do you think your doctor cares about you? And it was some like 30 or 40% of people said that their doctor cared about who they were, or was a good doctor, or they trusted their doctor. So then they took that same group of doctors that they had surveyed their patients. And they said, what I want you to do is when you walk into the room, I want you to make eye contact with them for 40 seconds. What That's you can a long say. Time. Yeah. They're like, you can say the same thing. You can ask the same questions, but for 40 seconds, don't divert your eyes. And then they did the survey again. And it was some stat, like 80% of people said that their doctor cared about them and had their best interests at heart and nothing changed except for the fact that they felt connected with Mm -hmm. in the first 40 seconds of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm an attorney. And when I, I did a podcast interview with a girl who has a podcast called the angry pharmacist. And she made a comment to me that forever changed the way that I look at professionals And she said, when you go to graduate school, they train the human out of you and you have to spend the rest of your career bringing it back. And as an attorney, I relate to that. I see facts, I see outcomes. And then I sit down in a room and I've got a human in front of me who is in the worst situation in their life and I'm seeing facts and outcomes. And so I love that this is the example that you chose to use when we talked about intentions, because as business owners, as entrepreneurs, as salespeople, I think we underestimate how much that power of connection matters and how easy it is to create when we do it intentionally. Yes. And I, you know, this is one of the things that if I could get this message across to every single person who interacts with a young human under the age of three, if I could get this one message across, it's this is a human being with all the complexity and all the parts that you have. They are not a cute little doll. They are a learning, growing, 
incredibly fast learning and getting who they are. They're creating a human here. Be careful what you do yeah. <laughs> with this, As, with this uh, little growing human, because yeah. when this little growing human tries to say something to you about who they are and how they feel as a toddler, for example, if you laugh because you think it's cute, you're coding that kid's brain, you're wiring that kid's brain around what it means to express who I am in a way you may not like later. Yeah. Um, as somebody who doesn't have children and spends as little time as possible interacting with them between the ages of zero and three, um, <laughs> I, it's so, the more that I, as I get older, my friends have kids and the more I interact with them, the more you realize how much of a human they are. They're amazing. And I think it's so easy to believe that it doesn't matter until they can walk and they can talk and they can interact with you. They throw a ball with you, you know, right. go shopping with you. And then we forget that by that point in time, they've already decided. They're, they're and already then they're there. like, why does my child hate, like hates a strong word. Why does yeah. my child act like this in public? Right. Well, mm -hmm. what did you do before you took him into public? Right. I, I love that. I want to switch gears just a little bit to your fourth um, SAS principle, which was negotiation. Um, children are amazing at it. And I think one of the reasons that children are amazing at it, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that that portion of their brain that experiences embarrassment hasn't formed yet. So they don't care. They don't care what they look like or feel like or they care what they feel like. They don't know, care what they look like or sound like. Mm -hmm. They have a goal and they're going to get to that goal and yes. they're going to try a bunch of strategies until they get there. Yep. Um, yep. Sales. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So sales is. They're like little salesmen and little labor negotiators. They really yes. are. Four-year-olds are phenomenal. Yes. Yeah. So as adults, how do we tap back into that while mm -hmm. still maintaining the goals that we now have as an adult that didn't exist as a child, how do we bring relationships back into the negotiation process and still maintain that professionalism? Because we're obviously not going to throw ourselves down on the floor and throw a tantrum in no, the middle of a sales meeting. That's so, not negotiating. <laughs> right. So how do we tap into that and make sure we're bringing that back into adult conversations? You know, and I don't have any genius here to offer that probably any other person who teaches the art of negotiation has. The idea of negotiation for a four-year-old is the base of it for an adult on the adult playground. My interest and your interest have to find an interest in common. It's Negotiation is about a win-win. It's about saying to myself, here's what I want from Amber. Amber wants this, this, and this, none of which is what I want. But somewhere in there, <laughs> I need to find a way to connect what I want to the things that I know Amber wants. Now, when you think of the way a four-year-old does this, think about a four-year-old who's been offered lunch. An intelligent adult offering a four-year-old lunch doesn't say, what do you want for lunch? Yeah. But says, do you want a grilled cheese sandwich or do you want tomato soup with cheese cubes? Yeah. Okay. The four-year-old really wants uh, something else entirely, a peanut butter sandwich. Okay. But he hears sandwich, so he knows there's bread in the house, right? So he's... He's learning, the four-year-old is learning mom's interests and mom's limits. What are mom's mm. yeses and mom's no's around fixing me lunch? Well, he's already figured out he's smart enough to know she's not going to get in the car and go to the grocery store and go shopping just to make me lunch. So that's out. It has to be in the house. Number two is she's in charge of all the daily nutrition from breakfast through dinner time and the snack before bed. So she's <laughs> going to probably have some ideas about what I can and can't have relative to what she's planning for later in the day. It's like kids are learning how adults make decisions and what their interests are. And they're learning to relate, connect, make a relationship around the win-win of you get what you want and I get what I want. Now, if wow. you can do that as a salesperson, you've sold what you're selling, right? If yeah. you can do that as a labor negotiator, you've signed the contract. The union contract is good because all it takes is getting people to see that they have either shared interests or interests that don't conflict in any way. Yeah, this is an incredible conversation because I feel like people get so 
tied down, especially when they've spent so much time learning the product and learning the services and learning what it can do for you, um, that they get so tied down into the nuts and bolts of what they're selling mm -hmm. that they completely forget to have the conversation about why somebody else would want it. Because right. in our head, it's a no brainer. Right. I know why people need your coaching program. I know why people need my NLP training. Right. Like exactly. I know I can look at them and be like, it's so simple. So it simple. Is. You need it. You do. <laughs> We're talking to somebody uh -huh. who doesn't understand they need it because they don't know what it does yet. So right. I, I love this. And I think that being an attorney made me better at this without realizing it because I had to look at clients and say, listen, there's a possibility we might lose. So when, if that happens, we have um, somebody who's going to make a decision based upon a transcript alone. Mm -hmm. So I need you to talk as if the person that you're talking to doesn't know anything about your case. And I feel like we need to get salespeople back into that of saying, I need you to talk about this. Like your person that you're talking to knows nothing about your product mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we go into it with, well, I know it does this, 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 and this. So I'm going to start at number 27 of the products. And then the person's like, well, I don't care about that. I care about number four. And you didn't even talk about that. Right. So I, I think this is so important to, to highlight in that negotiation of just go back to being a kid. Like you have such an amazing way of helping people understand that kids have it right all along. And then we just mess it up as adults. Like yes. we've got to figure out how to bring it back into being a kid. <laughs> yes. If we could, if we could trust like a newborn infant, if we mm. could literally trust like a newborn infant. And by that, I mean, know what you need know where you get your need met. Okay, that's all it is. I don't trust people or not trust them. I trust them to meet my needs. So what are the needs that I'm getting met by these people? Are they doing a good job? Is somebody else around who might do it better? Could I teach this person who's really important to me how to better meet my needs so that I will trust them more? It becomes a whole different conversation rather than that's a good person, that's a bad person. I'm a good person, I'm a bad person. It changes the conversation completely to what can we do to come more into connection with each other, to come more into relationship with each other. So for those people who are listening to this either on the live stream or after on the podcast or on the YouTube channel or wherever they happen to be finding this content, which is saying, holy cow, I've never thought of it like this before, which should be every <laughs> human who's listening. Where can they find more information about this? My website is lcarolscott.com. No punctuation, no E on Carol. Um, and I would like to offer everybody listening, whether you're live right now or watching or you're listening later, um, a gift I have a little book at 28 page PDF cover to cover that explains all seven self-aware success strategies, how we develop them in early childhood and gives you a sort of little uh, mini assessment, a list of questions to ask yourself to take a look at how's that working for you as an adult and kind of gets you in the framework of all oh, these are strategies for me to be successful as an adult that I could have been using all along. And the idea of the development do-overs uh, can get through my coaching. I love it so much. Um, we'll so just send, send me an email to get the book out. I'm sorry, I forgot to say that. So carol at lcarolscott.com. And I will we'll send it back to you. By, just mentioned this podcast um, or our lovely host, Amber, in your subject line. Perfect. We'll go ahead and put that all in the show notes as well for anybody who wants to um, go ahead and grab that, which you should. I want to switch gears just a little bit in the time that we have left and switch to the success side of this podcast. And it ties in so much to what you're talking about. We, I believe that we spend too much time focusing on things and not enough time focusing on success. Ooh, and amen. because we believe the things will be success, and I believe that the only way to get over that is to truly have conversations with ourselves about what success means, which ties so much into what you talk about of having a conversation about what you need or don't need and who's going to meet those needs. So for you, in the individualized definition of what success means, how do you define it for yourself? What's that overreaching macro definition of success for you? For me, Amber, success is really about authenticity living in integrity, walking my talk, 
being the person who I say that I am. And I think that's a work in progress and that's okay. Um, I recognize when I'm out of alignment with my intention and try to move back to it. I appreciate people in my life who help me see those moments, but it's really about growing more and more into greater alignment and integrity with authenticity as a person. And that leads to better connections. Yes. Better relationships. Yes. So that brings me to my next question, which is this micro definition of success. As we know, we can never make it to a big place if we don't pay attention to the small steps along the way. So I have a journal that I've created for myself that focuses on success. And it says today will be a success if, and that's the first thing I look at it every morning. And today was a success because, and that's the first, the last thing I look at every night for you. Nice. How do you know that your days are a success? When you lay down at the end of the day and you are closing your eyes, how, how do you know your day has been successful? <laughs> I think there's, there's two ways. There's one that I know in the moment. So I have this, I, it's like a little internal barometer that I think of as a bell that rings and it, it just resonates a vibrating feeling in my chest. When I take a step forward that I is on my path, that was the right thing to do. I just feel this sort of resonance of, yep, that was the right thing to do. I just know it. It's like an inner knowing. So if I've had a lot of those in one day, it feels like a very successful day. <laughs> if I, even if I have one, it feels like a successful day. But if a lot of them are there, like, woohoo. Woohoo. And I, then I think what happens is when I lie down at night in my bed, if I can take a deep breath and just breathe it out and feel the day flow out of me like unnecessary tension, I think that's a successful day. Because if I wasn't thinking it was a successful day, I would my mind would be churning with all the things I didn't do, didn't get right. And that involves muscle tension always. When the thoughts are doing that, there's a tight muscle somewhere or 12. <laughs> I love that. And I, and I don't go to sleep well on those nights. I think I there's a real that. difference. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, what is one piece of advice, resource, actionable thing that you believe people could do today to start to move themselves closer to a, what they believe to be a successful life? Start noticing the moments when you flash quickly from where you were, whatever emotion you were in, into anger, mm. disappointment or resentment. So anger is uh, like a growling kind of feeling, a grr, um, whereas resentment is a how dare you, <laughs> right? So when you, when you get into one of those places, look at what happened, like try to live stream back, you know, like just drag the, the <laughs> drag yes. the indicator back a few seconds on the live stream and see what just happened right before that. Who did what? What was the expression on the person's face? What was the tone of voice? what they say exactly? Not how did you take it in, but what were the words spoken? And see if you can start to see the pattern that leads you into those moments. What are the things that are happening consistently that take you into resentment, that take you into anger? Um, and start examining yourself. That's self-awareness. Start looking at your wow. patterns. There's something I love so much about what you just said, and it was because you went somewhere completely different than I expected you to go, because I feel like most people would go the other way, and they would say, start focusing on the times that you are really happy and you feel amazing about what you're doing, and I feel like it's such a misleading place to be. Because that peaceful place where we don't necessarily feel happiness or anger is that like zen successful place, right? Like we mm -hmm. would explode if we lived in that happiness place all the time. We'd shut down. But yeah. I feel like people spend so much time unhappy that they notice those happy points. So I love that you said go the other way. Nobody has ever said that before. Well, I, you know, I think when we're, I think about the martial arts and when, uh, like in, um, is it Tai Chi, Taekwondo, I forget, where they talk about, you know, when you meet resistance with resistance, all you do is increase the resistance. Mm. And so what I say is go to the place of resistance and take a look at what's happening there, because that's the only way to make it into something that can be released. You have to find out what's holding it together and keeping it pushing. And those moments are moments when we are in resistance to life in some way. 
Yes. Uh, and so it's important to notice them. And because then I can say, oh, I'm going to step out of the way and let that go by. <laughs> I'm not going to keep pushing on oh, that anymore. So good. This has been such an incredible conversation. And I feel like you and I could talk for hours. Seven um, hours sounded like a good estimate. I thought. It yeah. Was yeah. So much. <laughs> um, so much of the life that I love that I have now ties back to me finding NLP and my willingness to assess oh, myself yeah. in the way that you have discussed my understanding that who I am was formed a long time ago and that it doesn't have to dictate who I am in the future. And right. I feel like everybody needs that message regardless of who it comes from. And so mm -hmm. I am so um, incredibly passionate about what you say and do. Thank you so much. And I'm really committed to, it's never too late to start the development do-overs and you are not stuck with what you grew up with, sister. We can do yep. this. Absolutely. So to end up, I would love to lighten it up a little bit, do a quick random round, ask you a few questions. You okay with oh, that? Oh, fun. Yeah. All that. right. If you could do any profession other than what you're doing now and skill and talent is not a um, factor, what would you do? Oh, well, I think I'd have to think without skill and talent, but with skill and talent, I would be a singer. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Oh, yeah. I'd be a professional singer. I love it. Any particular genre? Well, you know, when I was young, I was pretty loving on folk music, but I was raised in the 60s and 70s. So that's just, you know, sort of generational. Um, I really think probably what I would do is become a children's music performer. <laughs> So I was waiting to see what you were going to say. Folk music fits for what I see. Um, I could totally see you as like a Broadway performer, like your facial expressions, yeah. your like, I just, I love that so much. Good. Um, if you could time travel, where would you go and why? Oh, I would go a um, hundred years into the future. Um, to see how things evolve, how technology evolves, how the human technology interface evolves and how we as a, as a world culture, as a planetary culture move forward, because I'm convinced that we're moving forward, even though it looks like a shit show a lot of days. Um, <laughs> and uh, I would like to see how it comes out in a yes. hundred years. What book would you recommend the most for individuals that you think get to in the business and entrepreneurial space, get to follow their definition of success? Yeah. And boy, in the business and entrepreneurial space, this is going to sound like a reach, but I'm going to tell you anything by Brene Brown. Oh, I love I'm currently her. reading Daring Greatly. Um, I'm listening to it on an audiobook, And um, I, I've read or listened to, I think, all of her books so far, except the, the latest one. And um, her take on her understanding of shame and vulnerability and the power of being vulnerable and authentic is life world changing. It's world changing. It's culture changing. I love and it so I, much. I, so powerful for people in business to get. You know, I said the other day, I can't, I think I put it on my website actually when I was doing a rewrite on my website. Productivity is still the point in business and it always mm -hmm. will be the point. And what we are understanding now is that underneath that point is a whole lot of human emotion and social interaction stuff that we've never thought about. You don't get robots with their feelings turned off at work. You get a gaggle of human beings who all come fully loaded. So, yep. you know, if we could understand emotion and vulnerability and interpersonal exchange at a different kind of level in the corporate world, changes the game completely. And productivity is still the point. You know, and productivity ties into being willing to allow them to be yes. who they are all loaded because those yes. things, those things drive what they are good at and more productive at so that you can make assignments, which is a whole nother conversation. Mm -hmm. Anytime anybody mentions Brene Brown, like when I was at my lowest and went to therapy for the first time, convinced I didn't need it because I was okay, even though I clearly right. wasn't. Right. Um, the first thing my therapist gave me was Brene Brown's Power of Vulnerability TED Talk. And yep. it changed the way I think about everything. Everything. Um, everything. So because I was such an insensitive host, your book, um, Just Be Yourself, yes. the, your guide to improving any relationship, where is the best place for people to find that amazing piece of um, authorship? 
They can buy it off of my website at lcarolscott.com and on Amazon and in any bookstore. So you can go ahead and order it from your local bookstore if you want to, if you want to support a local Sticks and Bricks bookstore. I think that's marvelous. You can buy it on my website at lcarolscott.com. I love it. Um, and lastly, because I am a music nerd and I need to know what I'm listening to next, what is your pump up song? What is that song you turn on and it just immediately lights your day? Well, you know, given that I was a child of the 60s and 70s, as I said, it's probably going to be no surprise. It's uh, it's um, Wild Thing. Yes, I love it. Get your motor running. <laughs> Ooh, and we Head sing. out on the highway. <laughs> so I think you're the first guest to ever sing us out on the show. Oh, so well, fabulous. That's amazing. Um, Carol, it's been absolutely fantastic to talk with you. I love what you're doing. I love what you stand Thanks. for. I love the awareness you're bringing to the world. And I love that you just have all the sass that you talk about. You know, it may be an acronym, but it defines you so much. So thank, thank you so you. much for coming on the show. I appreciate you. Thanks, Amber. Good to meet you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the More Than Corporate Podcast. If anything that was said during this episode resonated with you or provided value in any way, it would mean the world to me if you would head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review for the More Than Corporate Podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to do that. I'm really looking forward to connecting with you. If you'd also like to connect, I've created a Facebook group that is full of amazing people who also make it their mission to live their best life every single day. If that's sounds like something that you're interested in the name of that facebook group is success center head over there request to join and i look forward to connecting with you soon